Um, so when we were here last, we sort of ended in the middle of a proof. So let me uh, sort of give you a, a refresher about what we were doing. Uh, we were talking about um, this, these quantum sampling problems, right? And the, the goal of the quantum sampling problem was you know, exactly what it sounds, the sample from the output distribution of a quantum circuit, right? Um, so, you know, the, the task is mathematically well-defined. You're given as input a quantum circuit C. Uh, and then the experiment is supposed to run the circuit on the all zeros input state, measure all n qubits in the computational basis, and it gets its sample, right? Some string y, which is a binary string of length n. Right, so we define this, this output probability, which is simply the probability that this, uh, this experiment sees a particular outcome y when it measures. We call that PY of C. Uh, and then the goal that we'll finish now is to prove the impossibility of a efficient classical algorithm that does the same thing. Right, that given a uh, d classical description of a quantum circuit, outputs a sample from exactly the same distribution as the quantum circuit. Okay? Okay, great. Now, we, to, to analyze this, uh, this, this sampling task, we introduced two sort of simple problems, or simple to describe problems. Uh, I call them the classical and the quantum sum problem. Classical problem, we're, we're given a, a classical circuit that computes a Boolean function, which maps to 0, 1. Uh, we're supposed to compute the sum over all inputs x of, of the, uh, the function f of x. Quantum sum problem, exactly the same thing, but now the efficiently computable function maps to plus minus 1 rather than 0, 1. And how hard did we determine these were? Sharpie, Sharpie thank you. Right? It's very simple to see. It's because certainly if I can compute either one of these sums, I can compute the number of satisfying assignments to a Boolean formula. Okay? A Boolean formula being a very special case of classical circuit. Great. Okay, but now this discussion became a lot more interesting when we considered relaxing this problem to consider approximations. Right? So, I, I, I define this classical approximate sum problem, uh, which exactly the same input, but now the output is a multiplicative approximation to this classical sum. Okay? And what we determined using an algorithm called Stockmeyer's, a result called Stockmeyer's algorithm, is that this problem is strictly easier than the exact case, unless unforeseen uh, complexity consequence happen, namely the pH collapses. Right? And, and the reason we believe the pH doesn't collapse is the same reason we believe that P is not equal to NP. It's something that we can't prove, but um, you know, 99 out of 100 complexity theorists believe it. Okay? It's kind of the best we can do in complexity theory. Um, okay, and then the, the way we're going to use Stockmeyer's algorithm is, is the following. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of a conditional statement. We're going to say, if a classical sampling algorithm exists uh, that efficiently samples from the output distribution of any given quantum circuit, then outputting a multiplicative estimate of any probability that that classical sampler outputs, okay, of any outcome that that classical sampler outputs, uh, is, is strictly easier than sharp P, okay? We proved that, and then we, we looked at the quantum approximate sum problem, and we saw that the situation was really different. Okay, so the quantum approximate sum problem, exactly the same problem. We still want the same sort of multiplicative estimation, but now we, we just made this very sort of seemingly innocuous switch, which is again that the function g is now plus minus one valued instead of zero one valued. Uh, and what we concluded is that in fact, unlike the classical approximate sum problem for the quantum case, where the function is plus minus one valued, the multiplicative approximation to this sum is exactly as hard as computing the sum itself. Okay, namely sharp p hard. Okay, and, and we proved this. We used some binary search and padding argument, um, and, uh, and I think that's roughly where we ended. Is that, is that right? Fantastic. Okay, great. And then, oh, sorry, I think what we really ended is, is, is this following, which is I, I, I told you to sort of take on faith that essentially the same argument can be used to show that giving a multiplicative estimate of the sum x, g of x squared, is hard. And it's still a binary search and padding argument. Uh, it's very, very similar, okay? Okay, great. So now here's, I'm gonna call this consequence two. It's a consequence of the hardness of the, uh, um, you know, of, of multiplicatively estimating this quantum sum. Uh, it's that estimating the output probability of a quantum circuit is sharp p hard. Okay, so how do we see this? 
Um, so here's the, here's the formal claim. I'm going to claim that given a quantum circuit C, estimating the probability that that circuit outputs all zeros when we measure all n qubits in the standard basis, that's this P0 of C quantity, that that's just as hard as the squared approximate sum problem. Okay? Good. The proof is by, by very simple quantum circuit uh, that's sort of ubiquitous in quantum algorithms, and I call it the quantum Fourier sampling circuit. Okay, so here's how this works. Here's the, the setting. You're, go, uh, you're going to give me your favorite uh, quantum um, function, g. It's, a, again, a function g that maps to plus minus one. Uh, and then I'm going, to, um, I'm going to use my ability, I'm going to assume I have the ability to compute the output probability of any quantum circuit, and I'm going to use that ability to compute this sum, okay? Let's say multiplicatively approximate. All right, here's what we're going to do. We're simply going to uh, you know, run the following circuit. We'll, we'll first take Hadamard on all n qubits. We get the uniform superposition, right? Next, we apply G, right? And now we get sort of a uniform superposition in the sense that you know, we have uniform magnitudes um, on each of the amplitudes, but the sign of each of the amplitudes is determined by the Boolean function G. Okay, that's why this is important that this is a plus minus one valued function. Otherwise, that would not be, uh, that, would not, that would not make sense, that, that quantum state. Okay, then we're simply going to take all n, uh, you know, we're going to take the um, Hadamard transform on all n qubits, and we're going to measure all n qubits in the standard basis. Okay, can anyone read my mind? What's, what's so special here now about one of the probability amplitudes? I'm thinking about the probability that we get all zeros. It's proportional to what? the sum over all inputs x of g of x squared, right? There's many ways to see this, the most basic of which is if, if you simply look at the last unitary that you just applied on n qubits, this, this Hadamard transform, you look at the, you say, the first row, right? What's true about the signs in that first row? They're all positive, right? And, and, and that's exactly the property that we're using, yeah? Okay, so, if you look at the, the output probability of this quantum circuit, the probability of this the particular outcome, of getting all zeros, right, it's going to be proportional to this hard quantum sum. So now notice that estimating, giving a multiplicative estimate to the output probability of any outcome of a quantum circuit can only be as hard, you know, is, is at least as hard as giving a multiplicative estimate to this, you know, um, hard quantum sum, right? We needed the square because we were talking about Born's rule. Great. Okay, so now we're almost done. Okay, we're, gonna, um, we're gonna put consequence one and consequence two together, okay, in the following way. So we're going, it's going to be a proof by contradiction. We're going to assume that there exists an efficient algorithm uh, that samples from the same distribution as any quantum circuit, right? So just by definition, that's this that's this algorithm here that takes two inputs, the circuit, and then the you know, sequence of random coin flips and outputs uh, any outcome y with the same probability as the quantum circuit would if we measured all n qubits. Now, by consequence one, right, that's the Stockmeyer consequence, we know that estimating the probability that s outputs all zeros, for that matter, any outcome, right, uh, is strictly easier than sharp p unless the pH collapses. Okay, but oh wait, wait a second, but consequence two, yeah, says that giving a multiplicative estimate to the same outcome probability, yeah, P0 of C, is sharp P hard. Well, because it's at least as hard as the squared quantum sum problem, yeah? Well, it's a contradiction. So there can't be such a sampler algorithm unless the pH collapses, yeah? Now, I don't want to take credit for this. Um, uh, the, the, the first time we see a similar type of argument is um, by Terhal Di Vincenzo way back in, in 2004. Um, it sort of took a long time for people to realize the importance of the result that they had sort of come up with uh, and in, until around 2011 when there was a resurgence um, due to a sort of similar um, but uh, you know, a little bit stronger result due to Bremner, Joza, and Shepard. Aronson, Arkhipov had a similar result. Many people have claimed a similar result. If you look at these papers, their proof is not going to look much like what I just described. But morally, it's essentially the same, okay? Whatever that means. Uh, but this is how I like to summarize their proofs, okay? 
Um, can I take any questions before I go on to more sort of advanced material? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, is the consequence one about uh, the classical approximate sum problem? That's right. And consequence two about the quantum Precisely. Can you explain yes, that? let's talk about, yes, let, let's, that's a fair question. Let's talk about how this proof works. So, in fact, I'm going to flip the order because maybe that's pedagogically a little better. Um, consequence two is not conditional. It's simply saying, you know, you want to estimate the output probability of a quantum circuit. That's sharp p hard. No conditions whatsoever, right? Consequence one is conditional. It's saying now, if we had a classical al algorithm, an efficient classical algorithm that's sampled from exactly the same distribution, then estimating the probability of all zeros of that classical algorithm is easier than sharp p. Now you put these two things together, and you say, okay, well, we're assuming that we have a classical sampler algorithm, right? Therefore, the output probability of seeing all zeros of the classical algorithm, which is the same by definition as the quantum circuit, because that's what it means to have a, a you know, classical sampling algorithm, that should be easier than sharp p, but we've proved it's as hard as sharp p. Well, you can't be easier than sharp p and as hard as sharp p at the same time. I hope you can agree with me on that, yeah? That's how it works. I had another question. Can I get it now? Yeah. Can, sorry, I didn't quite. Can I think about? Ah, the depth of the circuit. Excellent question. No, very, very little. Um, okay, well, sorry, I should agree. The answer is really yes, but extremely little. All right. Uh, if you if you count the depth of the circuit, right, it's just that quantum Fourier sampling circuit. So there were, there's a, la a layer of Hadamards on all qubits, that's depth one, right? A second layer, actually a little bit more, let's, let's say a second layer uh, that, that you know, queries the function in superposition. But we needed that function to be uh, a Boolean formula. Um, and it, it turns out that it needs to be something like a, a CNF for that to work, uh, for the hardness. So let's say, let's give ourselves like another depth two, depth three, something like that. Okay, so now we have depth four. Then we just have a, another layer of Hadamard that adds another depth. So let's say depth four, you know, something like that. Could be depth five. Definitely constant depth circuit. Yeah? Yes? No, yeah, okay, good. No, no, no uh, that's not how this works. Yeah, well, it's not how this works. Uh, let's talk about the, let's, let's again sketch how the proof works. Um, so what we're doing is we're taking the classical sampler, we're assuming it exists, and we're saying that the probability that that classical sampler outputs all zeros, that's an n-bit string, right, can be redefined in terms of a classical sum problem. Now how did we, do you remember the, the proof? How did we do that? So you're absolutely right. We have a really a Boolean function that's computed by this sampler, and we're interested in the probability that that Boolean function, out, it's not, I guess it's not Boolean, it's n-bit function. We're interested in the probability that that, that, that you know, Boolean function outputs zero to the n, or whatever, yeah? Now, we had a clever trick that we talked about last time to map that to a zero-one function. How did we do it? Precisely, precisely. So we defined a 0, 1 valued function, and all it did is took the input of this function, which happens to be a random bit string, and it output 1 if on, you know, if on the input of this random bit string that sampler outputs all zeros. Otherwise, it outputs 0. Therefore, we've taken the probability that that sampler outputs all zeros and mapped it into sort of a, a 0, 1 sum problem. So if that was the question, that's, that's maybe the better answer. But we, we talked about that last time. Yeah, any more? That's a good question, though. Any, any others? Well, then I have a question for you. Um, so, so wait a second. Uh, we just tried to prove that you can't sample from the output distribution of any quantum circuit, unless the pH collapses. But the quantum algorithm does sample from the output probability of a quantum circuit. And in fact, it's completely trivial. Takes the all zero state, runs the circuit, measures all n qubits. By construction, that's exactly what it does. So wait, why doesn't the pH collapse? What step breaks when you consider the same hardness analysis 
but have a quantum circuit rather than a classical sampler. This was in the problem set yesterday, but this is maybe the most important problem here, so let's uh, talk about it a little bit. Um, I'm gonna wait for a few hands. We really, we're stumped about this? Yeah. Why, why not? Yeah, why not? Because you have negative amplitude. Right? Uh, that's, that's, that's right, but it's like, I, I think it's a step before that. It's a step before that. You absolutely can't do the Stockmeyer's approximate counting algorithm. That's the whole point. What are we counting in the Stockmeyer approximate counting algorithm? The number of inputs that map to a certain outcome, all zero. And those inputs in this case happen to be random uh, coin flips, right? So it was absolutely critical in this argument that we assumed that a classical sampling algorithm was, could be written as a deterministic algorithm, S. Whether I said that or not, that's what I meant by S, a deterministic algorithm, that takes as input some random coin flips. Okay? And then we use Stockmeyer's algorithm to count the fraction of coin flips that output some outcome, like all zeros. Is it obvious that a classical, that, sorry, that a quantum algorithm can be written as a deterministic algorithm with some random coin flips. Absolutely not. Not only is it not obvious, you can think of this in another way. It's a proof that if you can write it out like that, you can write a quantum algorithm as a deterministic algorithm with some classical coin flips, that the pH collapses, okay? So, sort of an interesting point, I think, um, uh, that's, that's, I think, often missed when we talk about the theory of quantum advantage. Um, what this is saying is, is pretty profound. It's saying that there's something very different about quantum randomness and classical randomness. Yeah? Question, yes? I actually thought it was a different reason. Okay. Tell me what, what about Yeah, yeah. So I thought it was because of the multiplication error. Uh -huh. When you sample a circuit, yeah. don't you get like an additive error rather Good. than a error? Right, Abs yes you do, but that's not how this is working. Okay, so, but it's a great question, so I'm happy to slow down and talk about it. We, so here's another way this, this analysis could have worked. In fact, it's the way that, that the media thinks the analysis works. Whenever I talk to the media about quantum advantage, they're absolutely convinced that this is how it works, and it's not right. But let me tell you what they think, and you can't get it out of their head, trust me. Um, they think that, okay, well, there's these, you know, what you show is that there's this quantum algorithm, and the probability that that quantum algorithm outputs some particular outcome, like all zeros or whatever, is something that's really hard, like sharp P hard, right? It's like this, one of these, you know, hard quantum sums. Well, okay, fine. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna repeat sample many, many times, right? And we're gonna then look at, we're gonna aggregate the outcomes, and we're gonna look at the fraction of times we saw zero, and we're going to use that as a good approximation to, or as an approximation, rather, to the probability that we see zeros. Yeah, that could totally be what you could do. You could also do that classically in the classical analysis. If you had a classical sampler, I think is what you were asking. Repeat sample many times. Okay, but hold on. The media is wrong. That does not work very well. Why does that not work very well? I have to say, I think this is a problem in the problem set today, but... Uh, but it's a really good question. We can, since we got it in this question, why, why does that not? Why does that not work? Why do we have to go through all of this, um, like Stockmeyer's analysis, really fancy, like '80s complexity theory? Why do we have to talk about that? Why couldn't we just say, oh, you have a hard probability, you know, in some all, some particular outcome, repeat sample many times, get an estimate to that? What, what's wrong with that? Yeah, it's not just that you might never see that outcome. You will essentially never see the outcome. Uh, like, is it the, the, the problem is that, that output probability, the all zeros, it's not just the hard sum squared, right? It's the hard sum squared over some like, I think it's like two to the two n. It's, a norm, it's an exponential normalization. So it's an exponentially small quantity, yeah? That means that if I'm trying to do this, this, this repeat sampling strategy, right? I'm going to have to have an, you know, a huge number of samples before I get any, any reasonable sense uh, you know, of what that probability is. Now you can formalize that, you formalize that using a Chernoff bound. I'm going to let you, and you can see exactly what that error is. It turns out to be a one over polynomial multiplicative, uh, sorry, additive error if you repeat a polynomial number of times. Well now the problem is one over polynomial, in fact, so what is the problem? So I just, so sorry, you can, you can put this together now. So I have this exponentially small probability, 
But I really want to know what it is, because that encodes my hard problem. I can like break people's bank account into bank, bank accounts if I, if I had that hard sum. That's a sharp P hard problem, tremendously hard. Much harder than factoring or whatever, right, or SAT. But I'm going to make this, the sampling procedure, the naive way to do it, incurs a one over poly additive error. What's the problem with that? I'm here to tell you I can do that too right now. Yeah? How do I, how do, I do that? Yeah, it just outputs zero or something like this, some constant, right? The point is, one over polynomial additive error completely overwhelms your signal. So the whole point of this analysis, and the reason we had to go through all of this, sum, the hard sum, quantum sum, classical sum approximation, is precisely because Stockmeyer's algorithm does better than one over polynomial additive error. It gives us a one over poly multiplicative error. Multiplicative errors are very special because the error scales with the yeah, with, 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 with the thing you're trying to estimate. And that's the whole point of all of this. Fantastic question, though. Do, yeah. I thought that's what you asked. I thought when you said, like, when you run the circuit many times, why don't you get... I, I missed your interaction there, then. Okay, but, but are, you, are you at least happy? Good, that's all I care about. Any, anyone else uh, want to ask a good question? These are really great. Okay, great, Let, let's keep going. All right, so um, this was discovered in like, you know, depending on how you count, somewhere between 2004 and 2011. Uh, and, but, but it's really not everything you could want. So in particular, this, this, this result is, is, is very much not robust. And I mean this in sort of two senses. This result has at least two weaknesses. Uh, the first is this sort of exactness assumption. It requires that the classical sampling algorithm samples exactly from the output distribution of the quantum circuit, or at least inverse exponentially close. How do we see that? Because the hardness result is entirely about the hardness of an inverse exponentially unlikely probability. So if I have the ability to mess up a very small amount of the probability distribution, in principle I could remove that probability or do something with it, and then, you know, I'd be stuck, yeah? So that's problem one. Problem two, which comes about when we start thinking about these, these random circuit experiments, is that there's sort of implicitly here a worst case assumption, right? The sampler algorithm that we're talking about needs to work for all quantum circuits, not just most quantum circuits with high probability, most random quantum circuits. How do we see that? What, what was worst case in what I talked about? Yeah, the sharp P, or, or really the, the, um, you know, the hardness of the, the, the quantum approximate sum problem, right? That was only true, right, when you consider computing the sum, or the sum squared, let's say, for any quantum function G, right? We don't know how hard that is if I just say, okay, most quantum functions G, or whatever, right? And we can talk about that, but a priori, we don't know how hard that is, right? So, it also needs this worst case assumption. And if you have an experiment, that's not such a natural thing to do. It means to convince me that you're solving a hard problem, you need to implement this experiment on every single circuit, potentially. Yeah? That's not really that, that um, that's not really exactly what my experimentalist friend wants to hear. Okay? Um, so, a major goal in the theory of quantum advantage. Uh, maybe arguably the most important problem uh, that remains open, is to prove the impossibility of a more reasonable algorithm that addresses both of these goals, okay? So, or both of these, you know, weaknesses, right? In other words, prove impossibility of a weaker algorithm, okay, that's approximate and average case, yeah? So it's a weaker algorithm, so proving hardness of a weaker algorithm is a harder job. Great. Okay, and, and the way we usually model this is in terms of uh, a bounded total variation distance. We'll talk about total variation distance a lot in this, in this lecture, so you probably know what it is, but if you don't, it's like L1 distribution, uh, the L1 distance for probability distributions, right? We take the sum for all outcomes uh, and we, 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 you know, of the absolute value of the difference between the two probabilities of that outcome, yeah? Okay, great. So what we'd really want to prove is that there's no classical approximate average case sampler that does the following. It takes as input, again, two things, a circuit, random coin tosses, 
and samples from any distribution X that's close in TVD to this, to this circuit. Okay, but with high probability. So in other words, you know, these average case statements always have the form of like, there's a good day and a bad day, right? That's how I think about them. On a good day, that is for two thirds of the circuits, this algorithm is going to sample from a distribution that's close in TVD to the output distribution of that circuit. On a bad day, that's probability one third over the circuits, this algorithm outputs complete nonsense. Something that could be ridiculously far and not even correlated with the output distribution of the circuit. Nonetheless, we're trying to show that this weaker algorithm still cannot exist. Okay. Let me ask a question though, because there's another thing that um, gets confused in the literature more often than not. This, this new algorithm, which is weaker, right? And do you think it's sort of modeling experimental noise in a reasonable way? Is that, is that why we're talking about this TVD error? Is that something that I take to my experimentalist friend and they say, wow, I'm so glad you've proven this result. That notion of error, this TVD, bounded TVD distance from the ideal output distribution, that perfectly captures what I'm seeing in my experiment. Is, is that what they tell me? I'm seeing the right, uh, the right answer, but can someone tell me a little more, why, why is that? Why, in fact, they, they laugh in your face when you tell them this, but, but why, why is that? A very really simple explanation. Anyone has it to guess? I can't tell if you're raising your hand or not. Okay, all right. let, 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 me, let, me, let, me, let me give the most naive reason why the answer is no. And it's a little, a little bit naive, but it, 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 it captures the spirit, right? Well, let's think about what this is really saying. All complexity results are in the asymptotic regime, right? So the system size is getting larger and larger. This epsilon we want to think about as some reasonably small constant, right? It can't be larger than some constant because actually the uniform distribution is already constant close to the output distribution of a random quantum circuit. It's not hard to sample from the uniform distribution. So this only makes sense when epsilon is sufficiently small. So that means, so let me now tell you what I tell my experimentalist friend. Well, here's how you invoke this hardness result, which I can't even quite prove at the moment, but I can almost prove it, yeah, I'm making progress. You just make your experiment larger and larger and you don't change the error, right? That's, that, that's not going, that's not going to uh, be very popular, right? So in fact, these experiments, right, they have the pro all experiments I've seen that don't correct their noise, they have the property that as you make the system size larger, if you don't compensate by making your noise less and less and less and less, which of course is not reasonable in asymptopia, you, you, get, you get an exponentially decaying signal. Okay, the fidelity decreases exponentially. Your error is getting worse and worse and worse and worse. It's not getting the same. They would be absolutely thrilled if their experiment had the same error as it got bigger and bigger and bigger without making their noise rate down. I've never seen an experiment like that, okay? Um, but why do we care about this? Well, I think we care about this for two reasons. It's why it's become one of the major goals of this field. Um, it's again, still unsolved. Uh, well, I think, I think first of all, because the, the proof techniques you know, that we used for this exact result broke down very badly, precisely with this, this bounded TVD, because it allows you to mess up the all zeros probability, right, which is only exponentially small. The second reason I think it's really interesting is because I think it does actually um, translate well into, uh, into a cla what I call classical imprecision. That is, let's forget for the moment that we're, 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 we're you know, trying to implement this experiment. Let's, let's say that we're uh, on, on an, you know, they were trying to implement this circuit in a quantum experiment. They were just trying to sample from the output distribution with a classical computer, right? Well, then actually this bounded total variation distance is not such a bad, uh, a bad notion. In fact, many classical simulation algorithms that, that you know, classically simulate quantum circuits have the property that if you run them for a longer time, right, they would actually get a better Approximation. In fact, that kind of makes sense for a classical for a classical algorithm, right? Classical algorithm does not have noise in the sense that a uh, a quantum algorithm would, right? So it makes sense that if you run the classical sampler for longer and longer time, you might even be able to do better. You might even have an algorithm that runs in polynomial n and one over epsilon time, so you can get like an inverse poly total variation distance rather than uh, you know rather than constant. Okay, now of course we're hoping that such a thing doesn't exist, but I do think this TVD uh, notion you know, is, a, is a nice model for classical imprecision. Not a good model for, for, for uh, experimental error, even though that's how like nine-tenths of these papers that talk about this will motivate that. 
Okay. Okay. Any questions about that? Yeah. That, that's, that's right. So in other, words, in, in other words, you have two distributions that I'm considering. The distribution that's actually being sampled, say, by the classical algorithm that's told to sample from the quantum circuit, and the ideal distribution. And then you say, how close are they? That's what it is. You know, right, because it, it's not, it doesn't make, it, 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 even for a classical algorithm, this exact sampling is probably too restrictive. You know, saying that there's no, no error whatsoever that this algorithm can make. That's, that's really, really tough. I don't even know what it means exactly when you think about like exact arithmetic. You have to talk about those sorts of things because we're making such, you know, because we're not making <laughs> errors, right? So, you know, this is the major goal. It's very well motivated. It just happens not to be motivated directly by considering experimental noise. And it's a very important point, actually, okay? Great, so let's talk about this. So how do we, uh, how do we analyze the hardness of this new, uh, this new approximate, you know, average case algorithm. Well, and, and by the way, we, we can't quite prove this, but we've gotten better and better results, so let me tell you about this. Well, the central problem of study is what we call the delta random circuit estimation problem, and here's what it is. We're given as input a quantum circuit C, just like before, right? And now we want to output uh, a number Q that gives us a, a, a delta approximation to the output probability of that circuit, with high probability over the circuit. So probability two thirds, let's say. So notice that this is an average case and approximate problem. Again, there's a good day and a bad day. And on a good day, two, probability two thirds over the circuit, this algorithm is going to give us, or this, this problem gives us a, uh, a delta estimate to the output probability. But with probability one third over the circuit, it can output complete crap and still solve the problem correctly. Right, so it's an average case, approximate problem. Uh, now, using Stockmeyer's algorithm, it turns out what we would get, and so it suffices to prove hard, the, the following statement, it suffices to prove the hardness of average case, sorry, ugh, let me say it one more time, to prove the hardness of average case approximate sampling, it suffices to prove that the delta equal two to the minus n random circuit estimation problem is sharp p hard. Now there's only one sort of sleight of hand that I'm pulling here, otherwise you'd understand exactly where this is coming from. The sleight of hand is that now we're writing for convenience, for pedagogical reasons, we're writing the error as multiplicative, as, as additive rather than multiplicative, which we talked about before. Uh, but it turns out that you know, for, for random quantum circuits, which is also what we're talking about, because this is an average case problem, works with high probability over a choice of circuit, uh, the, uh, the size of the, oops, sorry. The size of, the out, of most output probabilities of a random quantum circuit is around two to the minus n. So in fact, this two to the minus n output probability is actually a good multiplicative approximation as well. That's why we're, we're invoking this Stockmeyer algorithm. And if you understand that, that's great. If you don't, you can just take for granted that the goal, in other words, to prove hardness of sampling, it suffices to prove that this delta equal two to the minus n average case appro additive approximate problem is sharp p hard. Okay, so that's the goal. That's what we've been working on as a field for over 10 years now. We still have not been able to solve this problem, but let me tell you uh, how we've been doing this as a timeline, right, in terms of delta. So remember, as delta gets larger and larger, that gets an easier problem, right? And so it's harder to prove that this easier problem is hard. All right, so in 2018, in our original result on this, uh, we didn't even bother quantifying what the delta was, right? We showed, well, we can get an exact, we showed exactly computing the output probability of most random circuits was hard. It turns out that you can go back and retrace our steps, uh, which is what Movisog did, and you actually get that the delta we end up showing is something like two to the minus O of M cubed. Now M here is the size, the number of gates of the circuit. Always gonna think about it as scaling like N times the depth. N is number of qubits, D is depth of circuit, M is n times d, okay? So in our original work, we didn't even bother saying what it was. We're just like, ah, it's two to the minus some poly of M. Movisog in 2019 has this really nice idea that we really should be accounting for these errors. Um, and he works it out, it's something like, and it, it takes a little bit of work too, it's not, not obvious, but it, 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 it ends up being that what we showed was that the delta equal two to the minus M cubed problem, 
was hard, okay? We were stuck for about two years at a breakthrough, and, and then we could prove two to the minus O of M log M, okay? But we're still not at our goal, which is two to the minus N. Now, one thing we can say, though, is essentially all of these results, which means that not a few of them that may not matter, uh, work even at constant depth. So you can take M equals N times a constant. That's your D. Maybe it's, think, four, five, something like that. Sufficiently large constant. Um, so that means that we're off, you know, in that case, we would be off by what we want by a constant in the exponent. Okay? Uh, well, time, time, sorry, times the log. Time, times the log. Okay? Uh, but we're not, we're not there yet. Um, now, in boson sampling, that's this linear optical experiment, you can do a very similar analysis, and things look a little better. Um, in fact, it's kind of infuriating because of how close we are to what we want. Uh, well, it turns out the goal, is, oh, by the way, the goal, the 1 over 2 to the n, it's really 1 over the Hilbert space dimension of the relevant uh, experiment. So for an n qubit you know, experiment, you have 2 to the n dimensional Hilbert space. For boson sampling uh, with n photons and m equal n squared modes, the relevant Hilbert space is of dimension 1 over e to the n log n. So that becomes the goal. That's the delta that we want to hit. The same results give us 1, to the 1 over e to the 6n log n. You can actually quantify this exponent. We are off by a 6 in the exponent. Okay? Uh, it seems really close, especially if you've been thinking this, of, of these problems for as long as we have. And they started out where we weren't even like, bothering to quantify what the exponent is. And now we can actually compute it. And it is a factor of 6. But uh, we don't know how to get, how to get much past that. Okay? And that's the, that's, that's the frontier. Yes? Yeah. Why can't we, uh, does it make sense that we don't try to prove Trappy hard, but oh. something that's like harder than BCC? Yeah, 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 excellent question. Yes, that would be, in fact, you're absolutely right. If there was a way, if I had a technique that could just prove that this was not in BPP to the NP, then that would be all I would need. So strictly speaking, the sharp P hard conjecture is like way more than I would, I would need. But the truth is I don't have a lot of like proof techniques that sort of say that something's outside of the hierarchy, outside of the say third level or BPP to the NP without proving sharp P hardness and then relying on Toda's theorem. Uh, anyway, but strictly speaking, absolutely, yes. That's a great question. Any other? Yes. Ah, good. What is the random circuit? I, it's exactly the distribution I showed last time that, that I said Google was doing, where you sort of fix an architecture, then you consider your two qubit hard random gates. Although, there's really no particular need to consider that distribution. It turns out these arguments work for almost any continuous distribution, where your gates are drawn from some continuous measure and not like some discrete set. Okay? Um, there are a few you know, technical requirements to the gate set, but they're extremely minimal. Um, Good, good question. Yes, yes, yes. So first, like, like in, the, in the random circuit, like not in the model sample, in the other case, uh, yeah. you really want also the, like the exponent to be log, uh, sorry, n. Yes. And not order of, of n. Yes, 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 yes. You're really trying for something like 2 to the minus n over poly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's why we're like so worried about all of these uh, constants and so on, uh, even in boson sampling case. Yes. Right, it just doesn't work with the, it's not the Hilbert space dimension. That's what the technique needs. So in another way, another way to see this, that would not actually give you the multiplicative estimate that you want, right? Anyway, the point, but the, okay, the, the, there's many deep answers to your question. The short answer to your question is simply, the techniques require two to the minus n, not two to the minus six n. Okay. Uh, other questions, these are good. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, sorry. Is there any hope of improving these techniques to what? Ah, uh, uh, I see. Yes, yes, yes. Good. Um, you know, formally speaking, that would be great. Uh, I don't see how to do it, though. And the reason always comes back down to the Stockmeyer's algorithm. That's the only way I know how to translate between sampling, 
which is what the experiment is really doing, and computation, which is what we know how to prove, right? And Stockmeyer's algorithm is the culprit here. I mean, it's, it's, it's an amazing algorithm, but it's also the culprit in this case, because it's giving you a multiplicative error. The multiplicative error in this case gives you a two to the n, two to the minus n additive error. Or really, like I said, more generally, it gives us something like one over the Hilbert space dimension. And so, you know, you'd have to, to answer your question, you would ha if you, it's possible, of course, you could find something like that, but then you'd have to find a way of, you know, reducing from, going from sampling to computing that's sort of tighter than the multiplicative Stockmeyer bound. I don't know how to do that, and people, you know, since the 80s have not known how to do that. Ah, yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, give me such a circuit, we can talk about that, right? The, the problem is you'd also, it wouldn't be enough just to give me a dis random distribution, you'd also have to show that that distribution has in its support a worst case hard uh, circuit, like the Fourier circuit that I just gave you. So it's not totally obvious how to do that. Uh, but formally, yes, I agree. That would be a possibility. Um, anything else before I go on? Yes? Yeah, um, I, I think there's a good question there, but as, as stated, it's a little bit too vague. What I would say is the whole thing is complexity. We're, we're, we're going to be talking about improving complexity results left and right. Um, probably the answer to your question is yes, but it depends on how you, 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 you put it. Uh, okay, now, how much time do I have? Uh, 50, good, perfect. So the inspir I'm gonna tell you though how we got all of these results, okay? Um, and the inspiration comes from you know, one of my favorite uh, results in complexity theory. It's a really beautiful result from the classical literature going back to the early 90s due to uh, Dick Lipton, uh, who shows the average case hardness of computing the permanent. Or, or what I mean by this is that the permanent is hard uh, even on a random matrix with high probability. Okay? Now, the starting point for, for his result is that in the, in the late 70s, there was you know, a very famous result in complexity theory which showed that the computing the permanent of an n by n matrix is sharp p hard, okay? Extremely surprising, especially in the 70s, uh, because you know, the permanent looks a lot like the determinant of a matrix. In fact, it's the same thing as the determinant with one minor issue, what, what seemed like a minor issue, which is that the determinant has a sign outside of this product, right? This sort of alternating sign, okay? And somehow the determinant is easy to compute. We compute it all the time. You use Gaussian elimination. It's not hard. It's polynomial time. The permanent, this is valiance result, is not only not in polynomial time, it's not even an NP. It's a sharp P hard problem. Okay, okay but, but, but Lipton is, uh, you know, he, he's not happy with this. He wants to show something even stronger, uh, which, is, which is average case hardness. The hardness of computing the permanent of a random matrix with high probability over the matrix. And for the purposes of only this slide, we're going to talk about matrices with entries in sufficiently large finite fields. I promise you we'll get back to infinite fields in a moment. We're gonna talk about quantum, but finite fields here, okay? So uh, to, to, to boost this, this hardness from worst case hardness to the stronger notion of average case hardness, he uses this algebraic property of the permanent, which is really simple. You can verify it immediately from the expression that defines the permanent, is that the permanent of a matrix is a degree n polynomial in n squared variables. What are these n squared variables? The, the elements of the matrix, right? It's an n by n matrix. Okay, great. Now, here's the setting of his proof. Well, the goal is to compute the permanent of a worst case matrix, an arbitrary matrix that you give me. You tell me, Bill, I, I need to compute the permanent of this matrix, this particular matrix. That's the hard problem. That's sharp p hard. That's what Valiant showed, okay? But I only have access, you know, uh, in, my, in, in my pocket to a faulty algorithm. It's an average case algorithm. Here's what it is. I'm gonna call it O. It's an algorithm that works to correctly compute most permanents over my finite field. The permanent of most matrices with entries in FP, sufficiently large F, uh, first sufficiently large P. Uh, so in other words, here's what O does, right? We give it as input uh, um, a matrix Y, and it, it outputs something that agrees with the permanent of Y with high probability. Let's say probability one minus one over some polynomial to be determined in a moment, okay? Notice this is an average case algorithm. There's a good day and a bad day, 
right? Good day, probability one minus one over polynomial in N, right? It gives me the permanent of that matrix. A bad day, probability one over polynomial in N, it gives me absolute nonsense. From the end user of the box, that's me, I have no idea when it gets it right, when it gets it wrong, I just know it gets it right most of the time. Nonetheless, I need to use this box to compute the permanent of the matrix that you gave me. Yeah? So how do we do this? Okay, it's a polynomial extrapolation argument, I think a very nice one. So here's what we do. We choose n plus one fixed non-zero points in our field, fp. We'll call that t1, t2, through tn plus one. Then a uniformly random matrix over our field R. We're gonna fix R, okay? Now we're gonna consider the line A of T, which is X, that's our worst case matrix, plus T times R. All right, so we're gonna take our worst case matrix, that's the one we want to know the permanent of, you gave me that, right? I don't get to choose it. And you're gonna shift it by a random matrix, a random shift, T times R. Okay, so that's, that defines a line. Now there's two observations, and when we get, the observations are both really simple, and we get done with them, they'll spell out how the proof works, okay? So first we call this the scrambling property, which is that if I look at each i individually, a of t sub i is a uniformly random matrix, okay? Why is that? It's not hard to see at all. We took a fixed matrix, shifted it by something random, uniformly random. What we get out is uniformly random, okay? So each of these points individually are clearly correlated, right, because they all involve x. Right? But that, that's globally, they're correlated. But if I look at each one individually, they're uniformly random. Okay? So they're sort of random but correlated points. Two is this, what I call the univariate polynomial property, which is that the permanent in this, in, in A of t, is a degree n polynomial, but crucially, it's a degree n single variable polynomial in t. That's, of course, inherited from the algebraic property of the permanent itself, that the permanent itself is a degree n polynomial, but in n squared variables. Now we've We've sort of passed this, this univariate curve through things, and we have a degree n polynomial in a single variable. What happens next? Yeah, 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 absolutely. I, so here's what I do. Well, I use my box O, you know, to evaluate each of these points, you know, the permanent of A of T1, permanent of A of T2, blah, blah, blah. Now I've specified a degree n polynomial in a single variable, at n plus one points. Well, that uniquely determines, uh, uniquely defines the polynomial, right? So what we can do is, is use polynomial extrapolation, like gradebook polynomial extrapolation, I think they call it Lagrange extrapolation, if you want to look it up in Wikipedia, to recover the coefficients of this degree n single variate polynomial. Once we do that, it's totally trivial to get back the permanent of the worst case matrix that you gave me, because we evaluate this polynomial at zero. And by construction, A of zero is X. Now, the reason this works, okay, even though the algorithm is faulty, is because we've been assuming here, and I didn't even really tell you, that the probability that this box O, this faulty algorithm works, is something like one minus one over, let's say, 100 times N, right? Doesn't have to be 100, but some large constant, let's say. And so what that means by a union bound, right, is that the probability that all of these n plus one points are correct is sufficiently large, okay? That's, that's how we're getting over the fact that this box is faulty, right? Because with very high probability, we can, we can be assured that this box outputs the correct permanent on all of the points. Once this box is correct on all of the points, we can then recover our polynomial and evaluate it at zero. So what this is saying is actually really profound. It's not something we see very often in complexity theory. It's like a handful of examples like this. This is a provable worst to average case reduction. It's saying that the permanent is hard even on a, you know, random day, okay? The hardness of the permanent, the reason it's sharply hard, it's not just because it's, it's, there's some very contrived instance actually happens a good fraction of the time. Another thing that I'm not going to show you, but if you're, if you're so inclined, you can see this, is in fact, this one minus one over poly is, 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 is not the best we can do. We can actually make w this worst average case reduction work even if you have something like one over poly. All right, so in other words, you're getting things wrong almost all the time, okay? Uh, the box is extremely faulty now. And yet you can use very sophisticated, uh, sort of, it's called list decoding, if you've heard of that. So error correct, classical error correction techniques to extract from this super faulty box 
the permanent of our worst case matrix. That's not going to be required for us, uh, nor am I going to explain that, but it's really cool. Okay? Um, any questions about the Lipton proof, though? Really? I don't believe it. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. I'm assuming that. In fact, not only efficiently, you can like look it up in, in, in Wikipedia. It gives you like an explicit form for like the coefficients of this polynomial in terms of the uh, in terms of the uh, the points. And so it's like a super easy thing to do. There are of course much more sophisticated polynomial extrapolation techniques that you can use. But at this point, we're just using like what I call the grade school method, which is just like Lagrange extrapolation. I think is the formal name for it. Yeah, you have a. This is sort of a historical question. So yeah, yeah. yeah. If you don't know the yeah. Part, but Toto's theorem was not which said that Sharpe is like outside of the polynomial. Yeah. It was not proved until '91. So how hard was it actually thought that Sharpe was when it was proved? Ooh. Uh, sorry. How hard was it thought yeah. that permanent? Oh, uh, that's that? Okay. Yeah, great, great. I mean, I was like barely born at that point, so I do not remember that. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's a great question. I, I think what you're really asking is how surprising was Toto's theorem? And I, I, every, everyone I've heard says it's pretty surprising, okay. right? So I'm not sure it was clear that sharp P had a relationship to the pH at all, or really P to the sharp P had a relationship to pH before Toto, and my sense is that it was pretty surprising, but you should ask someone who was around. Okay, so people just understood that it, the permanent was clearly harder than the determinant. That's right, and also that, and also they, they had this sense that you know the sharp p was clearly the class of counting problems, so it was generalizing n p. That's obvious. What's not by definition? What's not obvious, of course, is the relationship between the pH and sharp p. And my sense is that that was a pretty big deal, so probably pretty surprising. But ask someone who's a little older. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. Because the errors that we're making, they all come from this, um, this expression. You, you see this IE probability that the box works is greater than or equal to 1 minus 1 over poly. The point is we can push that poly down as far as we want. Yes, that's a parameter of the problem. I mean, it makes the result weaker, but, but we can push it as far as we want. Now, I'm saying let's push that to like 1 over 100 times n. I think even 1 over 6n is enough or whatever. You do the algebra, okay? Well, if that's the case, right, then in fact we have... So it's 1 over 6 times n plus 1, maybe, let's say. Then, in fact, we have n plus 1 points we're giving it, right? And so then it really, by, by a union bound, right, with, you know, it's going, to, it's going to, with very high probability, whatever, 5, 6, or whatever, whatever I said, um, right, it's going to work on all the points. And when it works on all the points, then this, this works, exactly, right? So at the end of the day, we only have that this works with high probability, but of course we can amplify this probability. How do we amplify this probability? Fixed matrix X, but many, many R's, exactly, exactly, and you keep repeating it, yeah? You see how many times you get the same answer. So this is an amplifiable problem. Good question, anything else? Yeah? Uh, I guess here your oracle only works for like a random, beautifully random. Yeah, thing. yeah. I think like in the Gaussian stuff. Yes, like yes. Good. Yes, yes, we'll get there. We'll get there. Uh, yes, this is going to be very important. It's going to be important when we consider distributions over, like, you know, um, over real matrices or real circuits, actually, or complex circuits, right? Because here, there's not really, like, a well-defined notion of, like, total variation distance or whatever. We're talking about finite fields. Like, what do we mean to be close? You'd have to define that. Uh, but absolutely, this is a big problem when we consider quantum circuits. Such a big problem, we'll spend a lot of time talking about it, okay? Uh, how, many how much time? Five to 10 minutes. Um, you know what, I think rather than racing through and talking about like a genuinely new topic, this is a great place to stop. So I'm just gonna take more questions and then we'll stop whenever, uh, whenever we want. Yes? Well, okay, we're going to give a, an argument which will extend this to, uh, you know, to, to say the complex numbers. It's just not what, I, not what I did now. Like wait for, if you wait until tomorrow, I promise you, you will see the, uh, the complex version of this, of this thing. Things get a lot harder, a lot more difficult. It, but it doesn't mean you can't adapt it. It just means, you know, you have to work harder. And that's what we do, of course. Yeah? So where does it break? <laughs> well, okay, so first, okay, I, you know, first of all, I told you it kind of doesn't in the sense that we end up fixing things. But the one issue here is when you start taking the obvious, okay, the obvious issue uh, is that when you, when you take a worst case matrix, over your 
uh, fine field. But now you add t times the other matrix, right? You're not necessarily, like, you don't necessarily preserve your distribution anymore, right? I think about it. Let's say this is a, a Gaussian matrix. So you, what, what are you really doing? You're taking some fixed matrix. You're adding t times a Gaussian matrix. A Gaussian, I mean IID Gaussian. Each entry is IID Gaussian. Like, do you have a Gaussian matrix? No, you have a Gaussian matrix. You're shifting each, each of the entries. Now, what's, what ends up saving you, though, and we'll talk about this uh, at least in passing, um, is that if you take c, uh, it's not, not c, t to be sufficiently small, right? Then you can say, ah, it's not Gaussian, but it's kind of close to a Gaussian, right? That ends up saving you, but it also ends up making this, this, this argument sort of very sensitive to errors that you might make in your extrapolation. We'll talk about that next time. Um, in fact, it's one of the sort of the highlights of that discussion, okay? So there's a way to, to make it work. The way that we make this work is by, by essentially taking this t parameter um, to be really small and show that it's close to a uh, Gaussian matrix, but it only works so far. Okay, and in fact, that's a big point and is a big part of why we can't prove what we want to prove, this two to the minus n accuracy. Yes, oops. Yes. Precisely, precisely, precisely. No, no, well, hold on, no, no, I, I, it, we're just, what it means is that the, the size of the field has to scale with n, that's all. So it's not over f2, it's every, for every n? Uh, yeah, it, it, formally, yes, absolutely, but I would say that that's what I mean by fp, but yes, you're right, for every n, you're talking about a matrix that scales, you know, the, 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 the field size scales with n. Otherwise, it doesn't work, very clearly. When you make the, yes, it's a great question. When you make the field size, let's say we just fix it at three, then it's not clear how hard that is. It's an open question, actually. No, it has nothing to do with worst versus average case. It's worst case hard, but the question is, can you make it average case hard? Yeah. Oh, I see. That's what you meant. Yes. That's what you meant. Yes. Yes. If you, if you take 0, 1, you can show it's worst case hard by Lipton. We can't extend this to average case. Yeah. Sorry. I, I didn't understand what you were saying. Yes. It does have to do with average case complexity. Forget what I said a moment ago. Yes. Thank you. Good questions. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, 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 good. Yeah, yeah, right. They were, they were um, I think they were being very quick and they were reconstructing how this proof works. And we were conjecturing that you needed this, this, um, this you know, delta random circuit estimation problem at delta equal one over two to the n, that we would need that to be sharp p hard to get hardness of sampling. But they were saying, wait a second, this is using Stockmeyer's algorithm. And Stockmeyer's algorithm runs in BPP to the NP. Now, I didn't, I'm not sure I told you this, but that's like sigma three, something like that, the third level of the polynomial hierarchy. The level doesn't really matter. It's in some constant level of the hierarchy. They were saying, well, to invoke a contradiction, which is what we're trying to do, one way of doing that would be to show that that problem should not be in sigma three because it's sharp p hard, right? And we happen to know by what other people have been calling Toda's theorem, which is a famous result that I didn't actually mention, but that we don't think that you know, the pH is in any finite level of the hierarchy, right? Um, but they were saying, well, wait a second, what if you could just prove that, like, something weaker? Let's say it's, it's not in, you know, it's, it's hard for, some, uh, for sigma 100. Well, that would be enough, because we don't think sigma 100 should be solvable in the third level. And, and, and that's completely correct on a formal level. It's just that I don't have a lot of, I don't have any proof techniques at the moment that, like, shows sigma 100 hardness and doesn't show sharp p hard, or some, something like that. If you could come up with one, because you're much more clever than I am, like, go ahead and that would suffice. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. No. In fact, I'm not actually exactly sure what a two. Okay, so hold on. Um, first of all, we're talking about like two qubit Haar random gates, right? Uh, now. 
and we're asking what distribution over two qubit Haar random gates are we, are we talking about? Well, it turns out that Haar random is not super important. Um, what is important, I think, is, is a few things. First of all, you want the support of the distribution over circuits to, be, can, to have a, a worst case hard circuit. So in other words, you, know, you have to have some maybe really small probability of sampling from the Fourier sampling circuit, for example. right? Because that's, that's how we get our worst case back. Right? Uh, and, then, and then you have to have a certain scrambling property that's true for Haar random gates, but it's probably true more generally. Uh, and we'll talk about what that scrambling property is. But fundamentally, one property we're going to use of the Haar measure, uh, which can be relaxed a little bit, but not too much, is that if you take it's sort of the defining property, actually, of the Haar measure, you take a fixed matrix, you multiply it by Haar random matrix, you get back a Haar random matrix, or something close to it. Now, you can generalize that a little bit, but that is the property that we're going to be using to adapt this sort of Lipton-style proof. And by the way, now that we've gone through it, you kind of see why right away, why we're going to be doing something like that, right? Because the whole goal of this proof is to take a worst-case matrix, so in this case, we'll have a worst-case circuit, and make it look random, right? Well, how do you do that? Well, you want to scramble it, right? How would you scramble a worst-case quantum circuit, just naively? Well, you'd apply Haar random gates. To, you multiply, you left multiply, right multiply, whatever, however you want to define things. Of each of your gates by a Haar random gate, right? Yeah, yeah, but no, no, but, but you're missing the, hold on, there's, there's, a, there's a misconception here though. It's a great question, but it's a misconception. When they talk about two designs in random quantum circuits, they're talking about the ensemble over the full circuit, not the, not the two qubit gates. Oh, I see, they work, you're saying, I, I understand. You're saying they work even if the gates are not, say, two qubit hard random gates, but something else. Yes, but not my techniques. Interestingly, my techniques uh, are not going to need, they're not going to need two design properties, but we also don't know how to get it with only two, like they're, they're like orthogonal assumptions. And we'll see what I need, but it's not going, you know, the proof that I'm going to use to mimic this Lipton proof to, you know, random quantum circuits, it's not actually going to use a moment property of the distribution, at least not directly. Yeah? Um, maybe one, do we have time for one more question? Or we're done? 